Hello and welcome to People and Profit. I'm Charles Pellegrin. Coming up in the show. The digital euro could revolutionize the eurozone's monetary and financial system, making it fairer and more accessible. But will the bloc's private banks let it happen? We'll discuss this with the executive director of Positive Money Europe, Vicky van Eck. We will head to Croatia, where the country's accession to the European Union and its Schengen zone has allowed Croatians to work elsewhere in the bloc and led to a massive labor shortage at home. And we'll see what opportunities and challenges await French businesses trying to make it big in the world's fifth biggest economy, India. It's a concept that has the potential of changing Europe's financial and monetary infrastructure. The digital euro as a currency could bring closer together every single person in the eurozone and the institution that issues the euro, the European Central Bank. Something that could leave privately owned commercial banks standing by the wayside. The ECB made calls for tender on this project at the start of the year in an attempt to find those who will be able to build the platform that will host this digital euro, as well as all the technical infrastructure around it. It's allocated 1.16 billion euros to the project. Well, here to help us understand what exactly the digital euro is and how it could uh, change our lives is uh, Vicky van Eyck of Positive Money Europe, a nonprofit based uh, in Brussels campaigning for a more uh, transparent and fair monetary system. Uh, Vicky, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, before we get into to how the digital euro could potentially um, change the uh, financial system, um, first of all, how would the digital euro actually work? Could people have their salaries, for instance, paid uh, this way? Uh, where, would it be, where would it be stored? And, and our savings accounts... Uh, uh, included as well. Um, I think before we go into actually how the digital euro would work, um, I think we need to stay, take a step back and just real quick explain the difference between private and public money. Public money is money created by the state or the central bank when it issues coins and banknotes. So in Europe and in the Eurozone, that would be the European Central Bank that creates physical cash euro notes for Eurozone countries like France, for instance. However, the majority of the money that we use on a daily basis and that we intera interact with is actually bank deposits, which is private bank money. And the distinction is really key to the digital euro because private bank money is essentially a claim on the private bank. It's a promise from the private bank to pay you the money that you have in your bank account. And of course, there's a degree of risk attached to that because the bank bank is a commercial enterprise that can go bankrupt. And as opposed to private banks, the central bank cannot go bankrupt. And so public money, which is essentially what the digital euro is going to be, and I'll, I'll go into that, but public money is essentially what creates trust in our monetary system. Because I trust that the day that I want to take my money in my bank account and I want to transfer it into physical cash, that I can do that. And so essentially what the digital euro is supposed to do is to be a digital equivalent of the physical cash, so the only public money that we have access to today, the digital equivalent of that. And it does this because it wants to reply to the increasing demand for digital payments. Um, so now that we've kind of understood the difference between public and private money and what the digital euro is, um, we can go a bit more into yeah. what How it looks like. How does it actually like. work and yeah. what does it look like? How yeah. does it work? Exactly. So essentially, what initially when the ECB came out with the digital euro, it, it made it clear that it didn't want to have a direct relationship with citizens. So it essentially wants to distribute digital euros through intermediaries. And in the beginning, that was essentially the banks. And the banks had lobbied very hard for it. They really wanted only the digital euro to go through their infrastructure. Now, with, with the progress of the digital euro and also the proposal in the digital euro, um, it's, these intermediaries have been, have been expanded to include uh, credit institutions, electronic money institutions, and even public authorities in some case. So you could, for instance, access digital euros through your bank accounts, but also any other kind of uh, institution, for instance, uh, PayPal or these neobanks and 26. 
Um, now, in terms of how it would actually work, could you get your could you get your salary paid on it? There's some important limitations on the digital euro, and this is where Positive Money has been campaigning quite a lot. And an important um, important element is the holding limits. So the holding limits is essentially how much digital euros can I hold in my bank account? Now, the banks have lobbied very hard against the holding limit being too high because they essentially see it as competing with their bank deposits, right? Which is how the banks get partially get their funding. So in terms of receiving your salary, it really depends on the holding limits that policymakers are going to end up deciding on. Now, positive money thinks that there should be no holding limits or a very, very high holding limit. And the limit that the uh, ECB has been toying with is around 3,000 euros. And it's worth mentioning that initially the banks, they wanted to limit it to like 50 euros. I just want to go back to, 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 the, uh, to the role of private banks here. Um, They've initially responded uh, to the deliberations uh, on the development of the digital, digital euro. Um, how they've tried to influence that proceeding, those proceedings, like how, how big is their influence? Their, their influence has been huge. Banks are important to the ECB, but also they have a huge banking lobby, right? So the way that the banks have been able to influence the digital euro is A, in the beginning, really ensuring that the digital euro would only be used through their infrastructure. So they were really scared about getting competition from a public payment infrastructure. So this is why originally the ECB mainly referred to banks as the main distributors of, digital, of the digital euros. This has opened up. So in the latest proposal on the digital euro, uh, it's basically all payments service providers, which, as I mentioned, includes credit, uh, credit institutions, uh, electronic money institutions, but even public authorities. As Positive Money, we really uh, welcome this opening up because we do think it provides some healthy competition to banks. Uh, another way that the banks have really tried to influence the digital euro is on the holding limits and also on remuneration. So the ECB has made it clear that the digital euro is not going to be remunerated. We're not going to get interest on it, which makes the debate on the whole holding limits even more important, right? Because imagine I'm a consumer and I have I open my banking app and I have two seemingly very similar accounts, one with um, bank deposits, digital euros. I can have an unlimited amount. Uh, it can be remunerated in my savings account. And on the other hand, I have an account with a limited 3,000 euros, digital, central bank digital euros that is unremunerated. A lot of people might not end up using those central bank digital euros. And that's why we think it's so important that the limits remain high or that there are no limits at all. Vicky Van Eck, you're the Executive Director of Positive Money Europe. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, insights on this uh, topic. Thank you very much. Well, to Croatia now, where the issue of foreign laborers and their integration into society has become a hot-button issue ahead of elections due to take place on April 17th. The country's economy is dealing with a massive labor shortage due to large amounts of emigration to other Schengen-area countries and population decline. Shona Bhattacharya has this story. If you're looking for a hot bowl of Nepalese curry, Croatia's got you covered. Thanks to the thousands of migrant workers who have arrived in the country from Nepal, as well as from other Asian countries. I believed that I would have an easier and better life in Croatia than in Nepal. That's why boys from Nepal want to live here. They believe that they will live better in Europe than in Nepal. After joining the EU in 2013 and gaining access to the Schengen zone on January 1st of last year, the country has seen a growing need for foreign hands as local labor has flocked to richer EU job markets. Since a permit quota was scrapped in 2020, the number of work permits soared to over 170,000 in 2023 in what is a largely homogeneous country unused to foreign faces. Croatian economists estimate 500,000 foreign workers will be needed by the end of the decade, and yet there's been a growing social and political backlash before upcoming presidential elections. Mentally and physically, Croatia is not ready yet, but they are happy to welcome all the foreigners. One of the big draws is the average salary, which is high for the region, around 1,200 euros a month. But economists say that's not due to a healthy labor market. On the contrary, it's because manufacturers and service providers need to attract and retain foreign workers. 
Add to chronic labor shortages the yearly surge of tourists to the land of a thousand islands, 20 million visitors to the tiny country of just 4 million, and Croatia may not have much choice but to continue to welcome foreign workers to keep up with demand. Well, India is the world's most populous nation and its fifth largest economic power. So obviously companies from around the world, including France, are aiming to get a piece of the growing pie. Generously investing in India, especially as investors grow more wary of China's uncertain business environment. Our colleagues from France 2 met some of the French businesses who've taken on that challenge. In New Delhi's busiest shopping center, the French bakery chain Paul has just opened its fourth location in India. Customers are already becoming regulars. With a growing middle class, India has become a priority for the French group. India has its like, you know, vast population. It has like, you know, quality of education is pretty high now. The spending power is much more. Any brand which is coming to India and which is not here yet is actually missing out uh, on something big. It's a big opportunity. According to India's embassy in France, there are more than 1,000 French companies in India, employing 300,000 people. Growth is particularly rapid in the aeronautics sector, as more Indians travel for leisure. But there are cultural differences that can make corporate communication tricky. The codes are not the same. One example, an Indian will not say no. It's not in the culture. The French will say no. So you have to understand the culture of this country to do business. Another challenge? India's long tradition of protectionism, government policies that restrict international trade to help domestic industries. Some companies, like French athletic retailer Decathlon, are working to avoid high import tariffs. Sixty percent of its products sold in India are made in India. And Decathlon aims to increase that number to 85 percent by 2026. Foreign companies are welcome in India as long as they do a lot of manufacturing locally. It's the number one reason to set up shop in India. For now, foreign businesses are willing to play by India's rules to access the market. France currently stands as India's 11th largest foreign investor. Well, that's all we have time for this week. If you want to catch up on our previous shows, please search for People and Profit on France24.com or on the podcast platform of your choice. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us on social media. In the meantime, thanks for watching and stay tuned.